reality is not what you have been told it was. Your beliefs, the scientific ideas, all of it is crumbling under the load of change. Something's got to give. What is reality? Is it a simulation? And if it is a simulation, is it a self-simulation or a world that lives in a computer in another universe? We've looked at trillions of locations in time and space, and it is so quiet out there that you can hear a pin drop. It is as though we are the first ultra-high consciousness life capable of manipulating the electromagnetic spectrum. And let's be clear, our descendants are not human. There's no reason we should presume that in deep time that most of our descendants are born on Earth. The self-simulation hypothesis, it's about the unification of spirit and matter and getting back to balance. And I think that unification of those two is the only thing that can really save us from insanity and self-destruction. Hello, beautiful beings. Welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast, where every single week we get the honor and privilege to sit down with a brilliant mind and open heart to learn more about the true nature of self and the world around us at deeper and deeper levels. My guest today is an incredible human being, and I'm so looking forward to diving into this conversation today. Some may know him as an individual who co-founded early on with Singularity University. Some may know him as a philanthropist and entrepreneur with his business, Irwin Naturals, which is an award-winning global uh, uh, natural supplement company. And how he spends most of his days today and this time is a, uh, a researcher and director at Quantum Gravity Research. And it is a nonprofit Los Angeles-based organization working on discovering and sharing a first principles quantum gravity unification theory. I memorized that. <laughs> uh, and he's also dedicated and devoted to supporting the global physics community at large through collaborative uh, efforts. He is an individual that I met just a couple weeks ago, and I'm so honored to help steward this conversation today as it's his first podcast appearance in this format, in this way, which I feel so privileged to be able to sit down with because when I met him, I was completely blown away by the profundity and depth of his work, but then also equally uh, enamored by the depth and passion of what he carries within himself for the mission that he's on. Um, I'm really inspired by individuals that are devoted to a mission that is larger than themselves. And I feel like he's taken on the task of quite literally the most audacious uh, task there is, which is to truthfully discover and share and prove how this reality works at a fundamental level. <laughs> so Clee Irwin, thank you so much for coming on. To uh, I appreciate you uh, just being in your um, presence here in your studio. What an honor it is. Thank you. Yeah. The, uh, the privilege and, and honor is mine. Um, we are going to be diving into many different avenues and rabbit holes today, but for okay. the viewers and for the listeners today, I would love for you just to share a 50,000 foot bird's eye view of um, an overview of how you explain to the layman person like what mm -hmm. what your work is. What mm -hmm. is this mission that you're on? Mm -hmm. um, you could perhaps share your mission statement and what that is, and uh, then we can just go from there. Okay. Well, our mission statement is to discover and communicate the geometric first principles unification of a bunch of stuff, including um, space, time, and energy, which would relate to sort of unification of physics but also information and consciousness. How does um, all of that tie together? And then how I came into like the audaciousness of that was um, through some interesting life experiences about 13 years ago, where at that time I would have described myself as an ethically minded materialist atheist. In other words, I did, you know, generally try to, um, I chose, right, to, to have um, as much of a loving way as I could, but the best that I could do with the facts that, that, that I knew about at the time was, well, there, there's, there's no true meaning to anything, right? A, a very materialist mm -hmm. view. And, um, and so then what happened is the universe started um, showing me what I needed to see to open up my mind. And I, you know, 
I needed evidence. That's what I felt I needed at that time. So the universe said, fine, here's a bunch of evidences. So you either have to decide that you're losing your mind and the evidence is just delusional, evidence that there's something greater than the materialist view, right? Or you have to be open to now include that as a mystery of reality, these you know, spiritual phenomena, psychic phenomena, you know, anything from just a premonition to a, um, a, a synchronicity, right? Those sorts of things, they yeah. started happening in a cluster to where, wait a minute, okay, let me check and make sure I'm not going insane. Check, nope, not going insane. Therefore, reality is more mysterious than, you know, the, the physicist would have me believe, you know, the, sta the status quo, the physicists on CNN yeah. that appear as guests, right? So then um, because my life path had brought me money energy, right, at that point, I was able to s leave the business to the business people who worked for me and just go down the rabbit hole of fundamental physics. So I was able to hire, you know, PhD mathematicians and physicists. And I formed, you know, this little group that's called quantum gravity research. And at that time I, I said, okay, well, I'm no longer a um, materialist atheist, but I don't know what I am, right? I don't know what reality is. And, that, and that's the goal of our institute. And so 13 years later, I have a an, an opinion about, you know, scientists, we call it a theory, right? So I have a theory of, of what I think reality is. You know, we call that theory emergence theory. And then, you know, the process of it all is called the self um, simulation hypothesis. And it, it's, a, it's an idea that reality self actualizes, self realizes, self creates itself. Beautiful. So I'm excited to dive into that. Um, but I also, one thing that stuck out in our last conversation and meeting is this thing that you shared that you want to convert money into thought. Yeah. Can you explain what that, what that is, what that means? Well, money in, in the first place is a thought. It's, it's information. It's an abstraction, yeah. fiat currencies, you know, gold is gold. I mean, if you have some gold and some society says it's worth this amount, cool. It's, that's what the society says it's worth, you know? But, but money isn't even gold, right? It's this abstraction, right? Um, and, and so, you know, through business, we can create um, this stuff called money. For physicists, we just call energy uh, some stuff that can do stuff. <laughs> uh, so it can, that is a substance, a thing that can do work. It can create change, right? Like you can have, um, but you can, you can also let let your let energy go to waste like you can charge a battery and just bury it under the you know ground and it won't really run your electric toothbrush or anything else um so you can do that with money too you can um, accumulate a lot of money energy and uh, just let it go to waste rot in the bank and uh, and not do really any change in the world right or you could try to put it to work and so the biggest types of change historically have been thoughts, you know, and, and I'm talking about unpleasant thoughts and pleasant thoughts, but some of the most profound things that changed the vector of collective humanity have been mere thoughts. They start as thoughts and they get written down or voiced and they, they can become reality. Like, hey, I wonder if we could go to the moon. And then it became reality. So a thought is therefore the most powerful thing. So if we're worried collectively about where we're going as a world, um, then we have to ask, well, what are the thoughts that have us on this vector that's so scary to us? Yeah. And what are the different thoughts, right, that we can, that we can put out there? And so, of course, there's all this polarization and, and the right and the left and all of the, you know, the struggle of the polarity. So for me and my team at Quantum Gravity Research, the thought that we want to put out there is this idea that, well, what if 
what if reality itself were made of thought? Like literally, right? Now, of course, that's not a new idea, but but to connect it to mathematics, so we know that this beautiful reality that we live in called nature, right? Chemistry, genetics, right? All of it. We know um, that as you go down the rabbit hole, down to the smallest scales, we know that it's very mathematical. We know that the the way nature is behaving is with these symmetries um, and it's mathematical. So math is a thought, right? So what we try to do is, is discover what is that fundamental mathematical thought that then spins up and becomes particles and then molecules like DNA and life and thinkers like you and I. So you've been um, so gracious in putting uh, certain documentaries and content out online that has been picking up a lot of traction. And I think it's because one, people really understand the fundamental position that we're at as a society and culture right now, which is, you know, it's very doom and gloom with the potential uh, capacity we have for mass destruction uh, to our biosphere right now to, you know, yet you share like a quarter of the people on the planet have mental illness, like yeah. diagnosable mental illness. Yeah. And it can be very scary, but like you're sharing, there are certain thoughts and beliefs that are kind of embedded, inherent in society right now that have led us to the place that we're at. And to introduce a new framework, a new theory, um, a new thought that could be so radically transformational that right. it could actually course correct us into right. a new direction completely. Yes, I, I think it's such a beautiful mission that you're on. And so I'm, I'm so excited to share more about the self-simulation hypothesis, emergence theory, and and dive into uh, dive into this a little bit more here. Me too. Me too. <laughs> uh, so self-simulation hypothesis, how do you explain in uh, in a basic kind of overview of of what that is, and yeah. uh, and let's go from there. Well, first of all, I apologize for the overly sterile and sciency geeky name that we gave it. You know, it's just a label. Uh, we wanted to get it published in peer review academic um, physics journals, um, so we could give it any other name, but. Throughout our discussion, I'd love to go back and forth between the geekiness of the science and the mysticalness of the spiritual implications of the self-simulation hypothesis. Um, so, the sort of overview, right, in a in a in a simple way, would be that you first have to. Um, decide as a scientist or a, or a thinker, a wonderer of what reality is, uh, do you think that causality is linear? That is, it just goes in one direction where a thing occurs and that causes a thing later in time to occur? Or are you open-minded to the idea that maybe causality doesn't work strictly like that? So for what modern quantum field theorists believe is they have known for a while that at the smallest scales, and we call it the highest energy scales, but it also relates to the smaller zoomed in scale, that causality, linear causality breaks down. So a metaphor for that would be, you know, a thing A caused thing B which actually caused thing A in the first place. So to even get your head around that apparent illogic, you have to question, why do you think that's illogical? And, and it would be because you subscribe to um, the old school, which is called Newton's physics, the pre-quantum physics viewpoint. Um, but in a lot of interpretations of quantum mechanics and, the, and very modern experiments, we say no, that the future can influence the past in some models, legit models. And if that's true, if the future can influence the past, then I am the future to myself yesterday. So then in principle, I could be influencing myself yesterday as I'm sitting here recording the podcast with you. And so that's a, a little bit of an overview of... Um, 
the self-simulation hypothesis, which would mean that if the future evolution of a simple program, and we'll get into simple programs, but if a simple program could emerge in complexity such that what emerges from the simple program's behavior is an entity capable of running the simple program from the beginning, self-actualizing itself, then you do not need an outside creator that you have an, on, an ontology or a worldview where reality can bootstrap itself, co-create itself from within itself. So we'll have to really unpack that, but that's yeah. the best I could do for an overview. A quick share from today's sponsor. I'm a warm beverage kind of guy. <laughs> I like my tea, cacao, and other products like from our sponsor today, Mudwater. Mudwater is a coffee alternative with adaptogenic mushrooms and Ayurvedic herbs. With only a fraction of the caffeine as a cup of coffee, you get the energy without the jitters or crash. Their original blend has chai and cacao, mushrooms like lion's mane to support focus, and chaga and reishi to support your immune system. I personally also love to use the rest blend as a part of my nighttime ritual. It has no caffeine and ingredients like ashwagandha and chamomile to help you chill out. Everything is 100% organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and delicioso. <laughs> I love what this company stands for, how they believe in creating healthy minds through healthy habits, and how they donate monthly to mental health causes. To try them out, you can go to mudwtr.com slash know thyself and use code know thyself for 15% off. And they'll even throw in a free rechargeable frother. As always, everything is linked down in the description below. Back to the episode. Yeah, one of the most fascinating parts I think of the work is to experientially and intellectually inquire about how a future self could impact a past self. I would love for you to just unpack that a little bit more because society's inherent understanding of time is very limiting. And so I would love for you to share a little bit more about how is it possible that a future us, which a lot of people are under, this, under the conclusion that the past is doesn't exist because it's no longer here. The future right. doesn't hasn't exist because yet. it hasn't happened yet. Right, right. So, okay, so I'll bounce back and forth. So what we do is on the cutting edge. In other words, what we do at quantum gravity research is controversial because we bring consciousness, collective consciousness into, into our model. So I'll bounce back and forth between what the status quo view is. So prior to 1905, which is when Einstein, you know, came out with his paper on uh, the special theory of relativity, it was believed that, as you said, the past no longer exists, it's gone, the future hasn't happened yet, and doesn't exist. And so this, this thing that made Einstein so famous is this mind-blowing idea that, oh no, no, not at all, the past ha is equally as real as the present, and the present is equally as real as the future, equal all real and that was that was very anathema to the to the current newtonian view at that time okay so if the if myself you know unless i unless i die tonight right but there's an incredibly low probability that i'm just going to die tonight right so there's a very high probability i exist tomorrow and according to einstein's theory um, it is as he, Klee, is as real tomorrow as I am here with you today, as well as myself yesterday. Now, in Einstein's theory, it says that if you expect to ask the question, can Klee from tomorrow talk to Klee from yesterday? Don't even ask the question because it can't happen because the signal using light would have to go faster than the allowed speed limit of the universe. But then came quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics didn't predict entanglement. Entanglement, when I'll explain entanglement, but in quantum entanglement came about by uh, just observation through experiments. And it's like, oh my gosh, what the heck, right? And it turned out to, to comport with the math of quantum mechanics. So entanglement is basically this thing where like you can entangle things like, for example, two particles, 
and the, and some particles have this thing called spin, like heads up, heads down, you know, tails or heads. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when they get entangled, okay, then you can separate them by any distance, millions of miles. And um, if you flip one from spin up to spin down, its entangled mate instantaneously flips its state, but not because of a signal being transmitted at the speed of light or faster or slower than the speed of light. It's, it's as though they're the same particle. So they've experimentally verified that. And then about 12, 13 years ago, they did an experiment to see if it would work if you, if you could separate the two entangled particles in time. And so we can um, separate things in time by changing their gravitational strength, right? Like if you go to the top of a mountain, um, time moves differently than at the bottom, right? And that's measurable, that's experimental. So anyway, they did that and it turned out that, yep, you can, you can separate two particles in time and they instantaneously react to one another. No signal, no, it has nothing to do with light travel. So with that being an experimental fact, we go back to that question, can myself tomorrow chit chat with myself yesterday or myself today? And the answer is, well, we don't know. Like physicists don't know for sure. They can pound their fist on the table, any individual, and say no. But the problem is they don't have a unification theory yet that unifies the theory of um, particles, which is quantum mechanics, with the theory of, of, of space and time. Think of the particles as actors, and they're always in a stage, whether it's outdoors or on a real stage in a sound studio. So they go together the actors in their environment. So the particles, quantum mechanics, it can never be separated from the stage, space, and time in which they mm -hmm. interact. But the problem is that best theory that we have as humans of, of, of space and time is Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is sort of an advancement on special relativity. And the best theory we have of particles is quantum mechanics. And here's the dirty little secret of physicists. Quantum mechanics very aggressively says that the that that general relativity is incorrect in its foundational assumptions. And general relativity retorts back and says very clearly that quantum mechanics is wrong in its assumptions. And and so physicists today are scratching their heads because we have some evidence that it that good evidence that quantum mechanics and general relativity are at least generally correct, like mostly correct. So string theory and other theories that try to um, fit the two together in a way that they agree um, have so far failed. Like they've never, like string theory is about 55 years old now and it's never made a successful experimental prediction. So the holy grail for physicists is still to find that unified theory of everything and to just add on another dirty little secret of physics is that we have this thing that we playfully call the measurement problem. And it came about by um, noticing that when we observe particles, they behave differently than when we're not observing them. And it has nothing to do with the light that we might shine upon them to observe them. Um, and it's a real head scratcher for you know, especially if you're a materialist and you've made up your mind about this or that of what reality is, um, it, it's a pun or a playful thing to say, call it a problem. Like for maybe somebody with you, your philosophy, if I ask you enough questions, I might say, well, for you, it wouldn't be a problem that your awareness of the particles is going to make an interactive universe be like, ooh, okay, let's, you know, Let's change the probabilities because Andre is observed, become aware. Um, but for a person like maybe how I was 13 years ago, a materialist, that would be a problem. And it's an unsolved problem right now in, in physics. So when we get to these questions of why the heck would consciousness or awareness change how the particles behave? And there are some physicists who say, 
that consciousness or awareness doesn't change it, but there are a lot of other titans of physics, like even like godfathers of physics, who say, no, no, it's a weird, spooky, weird problem. And you can't just hand wave it off. So you get back to that thing. Can Klee tomorrow chit chat with Klee yesterday? Can there be a dialogue, even subtle, even subconscious? There's nothing specifically that prohibits that, that we know of in the context of trying to fit quantum mechanics and general relativity to get, and together, and partly because we haven't fit them, nobody has fit them together successfully. Mm -hmm. So what I believe is that by, by a lot of evidence I've seen in peer review stuff, as well as my own personal experience, that two consciousnesses separated in time can connect and share consciousness, share thought. So if that were possible, then we have this observation of reality called the complexity arrow of time. Things get more complex, richer over time. Yeah. So let's go back to the story of the Big Bang, right? After the Big Bang, we had this homogeneous uh, mist called the quark-gluon plasma. It was just like quarks and gluons, that's it. The spacing between them was typical. It wasn't clumps, it was just misty. And then, um, and then that evolved into something more complicated called the uh, early hydrogen universe. It was just hydrogen. It was really boring. There was no other atoms. But it was more complicated than the quark-gluon plasma because the quarks and gluons self-organized into these more complicated hydrogen atoms. And then um, things started clumping up into stars. And then the stars went supernova. And they produced about 100 other um, atoms, other types of atoms. And then those atoms started teaming up into complicated groups like DNA, molecules. And the story just keeps going to where the complexity uh, of the universe is, is, is like unidirectional. Things get more complex over time on average, not, not less. And so if you take our consciousness the way, the way we kind of recognize that we're smart because we're smart like we're doing stupid things but i think it's clear that we're smart animals primates are pretty smart they have the ability to do abstraction like stories and and math and stuff yeah so so i don't think any materialist or any spiritual person i don't think there's anybody who really believes that humans are the epitome of what's possible in terms of you know, the magnitude of awareness or consciousness that can exist in a universe that keeps getting more complex. So what if there was something forward in time of us in this, in this special relativity view where it does exist up there just at a different location in time, but it's legit, it exists. And we know about this unidirectional complexity arrow of time. So we can say, well, in principle, given enough time, there should be consciousnesses forward in time that are vastly more conscious than us. And does it get to a point where it becomes sufficiently vast and conscious? Maybe it's a collective, okay? But is it possible with the laws of physics as we understand it for a consciousness sufficiently vast to run within its vast consciousness a simulation of itself from very simple origins. And then, and I think any honest arguer would have to say, oh, sure, there's nothing specifically in the laws of physics as we know them that says no way. And then we can bring in that famous statement, whatever is possible, given enough time will eventually occur. Hmm. So if it is possible for a vastly advanced collective consciousness to emerge, given enough time, it will have the capability to self-simulate, self-create, self-actualize itself. <laughs> All right, so we just opened up many different things. We did. <laughs> we could spend the rest of today unpacking. I, I think under, fundamentally we don't know enough about the nature of consciousness to see how it could be connecting, you know, unifying multiple different theories that have been existing for some time. I want to 
where where shall we go first? <laughs> There's so many things to pick up here. I love how there's many different things as you start to observe, they kind of stack on top of each other to start to build a potential hypothesis for mm -hmm. self-simulation. Mm -hmm. One of those is how when we observe and it's most fundamental, you know, exam in nature that reality is pixelated. Yes. Can you explain that? Yeah, well, it comes from um, the math really of quantum mechanics where we discovered that we thought that light was a wave originally, humanity, right? And and we saw, we thought what the waves of light or energy were in this very smooth thing called space time. And so therefore it was not perceived to be pixelated. And quantum mechanics really fundamentally says that actually no, light can only, energy can only come in these little, um, pixels or building blocks of of uh, energy and length and volume can only come in these little uh, little pixels and time can only come in these pixels of frozen moments effectively. So those are called the Planck time, the Planck volume. You know, and then we have these these this minimal Planck energy. So that was a big um, surprise. Um, in the 1920s when quantum mechanics came about. And it's really that realization of that sort of pixelated is one word, but this, this, this discrete nature of energy um, that really led to the digital you know, revolution and the, all of the advancements that we have. It's very, very small. Like it's, it's, it's hard to even visualize how small it is, but you can visualize how you can take a length like that and just say 10 times smaller. So maybe 10 times smaller is like that. It's easy to visualize. I can even do it again, 10 times smaller. Mm -hmm. So to visualize the Planck volume, you'd, you'd do 10 times smaller um, from a meter, uh, like 34 times. So, so abstractly, you can do that, right? And so you can say, okay, it's just like hella small, <laughs> right? <laughs> Planck volume. And then you do the same thing with a second and you say, okay, I can kind of imagine tenths of a second because I've seen it on a on a digital counter. It moves really fast, tenths of a second, and then um, and then you do that forty four times, ten times smaller, ten times smaller, forty four times. So, quantum mechanics implies that a that a that a duration in time can be no no shorter than that, and and it, and that sort of implies that it's like a frozen moment. It, it kind of implies that reality may be like a thirty five millimeter film except really fast and with really small pixels. So how do we know that it's not a limitation of our instrument of our instruments to know that reality isn't even at its most fundamental examine, you know, to examine mm -hmm. it doesn't go even smaller. Yes, so well, our instrumentation doesn't get us remotely close to the Planck volume or mm -hmm. the Planck time. It's mathematics. So it's uh, yeah, it's mathematics and experiment but the experiments that support quantum mechanics, the math, the quantum mechanics is just math, right? Yeah. It's model, theory, equations. But there's just thousands upon thousands of experiments that are predicted by that math. And in fact, we've never done an experiment that the math of quantum mechanics predicts that's failed to match the prediction. And so, we do have plenty of evidence that energy, right, comes in these discrete um, pixels or packets of energy. Um, but to go zooming down to the Planck time and the Planck volume, to do that experimentally would require a lot of energy, right? Like the equivalent of countless trillions of nuclear power plants, like an, uh, an unattainable, you know, currently unattainable level. So most, a lot of physicists believe that the Planck, the Planck length, the Planck volume, this stuff is real, but you're right. There's no, you know, there's no full evidence, but like experimentally to actually zoom down there. But, um, but people who think that reality is a simulation 
they often use that pixel as you know a pixel concept um, that's well supported by quantum mechanics and some experimental evidence to to say well what or if it were a simulation it would just be an ultra rich high fidelity simulation um, but why would if it's a simulation why would you waste zooming like why would it have to go to this infinite precision if there's no consciousnesses that are observing at that level of precision or or anybody who cares about that level of precision it's as though reality may be like john wheeler the guy who invented the phrase black hole he liked to say that we live in an interactive reality where our observations and awarenesses of things around us cause the universe to interact like an like a like an interactive simulation so yeah so pixelation is like is just evidence that's thing with physics there's never proof of anything there's just supporting evidence so for everybody that's listening right now what we're explaining and it is taking you know it's going to take some time to continue to unpack but it has incredible implications for perceptions on what potential alien life is, for the direction of artificial intelligence, for the evolution of consciousness. What's really interesting is how you, uh, one, one you know avenue of your work is taking these 8D crystals, projecting it down to a 4D quasi-crystal and then to 3D. To, um, I would love for you to unpack a little bit how that there is an inherent universal language that is fundamental and inherent within life. The closer you pay attention, that starts to become revealed. There's these there's laws, there's um, there's ratios, and and they they point to how reality works at a fundamental level, mm, right? Mm. So I'd love for you to pack, unpack a little bit of that and how some of those discoveries um, give us some answers as to potentially how reality works. For example, the golden ratio, and you know various, various things. Yeah. So a lot of what you know we've done in the papers that we've published and the work we've been doing comes to us through um, intuition. And then we're scientists, so we're gonna challenge our intuition and, and, and that's the scientific method. Sci scientific method is just the, it, the, hum the humility of saying, any idea I come up with, whether it's general relativity, quantum mechanics, it's always a theory that's always possible to be replaced by a better picture of what reality is and what what we allow to replace is things that are better supported by experiment. Experiment is just a fancy word for observation. How are we perceiving nature to behave? So, so we think um, that when we combine these ideas like, okay, so we believe that reality is pixelated and we believe that it's made of math right? A lot of physicists believe that. Um, but why would it be interactive with us? With Because this measurement problem is a real, is a real phenomenon. Um, then, um, you know, you get into this Ouroboros symbolism where, you know, A caused B, which caused A, which caused B, which caused A, and you let go of that older idea of linear causality. And then, and it's in that where you can say, as a hypothesis, a sufficiently evolved consciousness from the future, which would be our which could be our descendant lineage. And let's be clear: our descendants are not human. The vast majority of them have different DNA, so they are speciated away from us. And there's no reason we should presume that in deep time that most of our descendants are born on earth. So they're alien, these descendants in our tree, and they're not all the same. It's just like go back to the origin of life here on earth about 4 billion years ago, and you see how it just keeps fractally branching out to fruit flies and rhinoceroses and dinosaurs and me and you, you know, homo sapiens sitting here. And, uh, and so you have to think about that continuing forward. If we get off planet using our abstraction of physics and technology and we move our 
consciousness out into the universe, they will definitely speciate. And it generally won't be speciation from survival of the fittest as much as um, bespoke steering of the genetic code, CRISPR technologies and whatever comes after that. And, and so those, those fu- that idea of future advanced consciousnesses, can they form collectives? Can me and you get into some psychic meditation feedback loop and literally form a little Andre Klee Borg, right? <laughs> is it possible, right? So maybe it is. And so, but if it were, and, and if it could be in the future, then for us in the simulation hypothesis, there is this idea where, okay, so it self-simulates or self-actualizes itself within thought, within consciousness, starting with a very simple program that's made of math. It's just elegant and simple. So what math would it use? Now, it's presumably really smart, right? This, that's the idea. Okay, let's say that if hypothetically something evolves forward in time and it's just hella smart, and it's going to need to, and it chooses to use math. So I describe it as um, physics as game boards and games. So, so a, an example of a game board is like the sixty-four pieces of a of a checkerboard. But you can play chess on that. You don't have to play checkers. So you can play more than one game on a game board. And so a piece of math, like a certain algebra, is a game board. And there can be different physics models that physicists use, like games, that play out on the same mathematical game board. So we go to this idea of this very advanced consciousness, almost godlike compared to us, right? Mm -hmm. We just have to imagine it to be very big. And it's going to choose um, either an inefficient game board and game to self-actualize itself or an efficient one. Now, Every physics theory has an unprovable assumption, and it's called an axiom. And so the axiom of our theory, emergence theory, and and the self-simulation hypothesis uh, is the principle of efficient language. So we believe that language is is thought, or you could say thought is language in action, right? Mm -hmm. Thought is the sort of verb form of the noun language. And so... Math is language. So this godlike collective consciousness in this story, this mythos, chooses to be efficient. It doesn't have to be. And so we hypothesize that it chooses. And so in our physics approach, we have an axiom called the principle of efficient language. It's a choice. It's a philosophy. It's a choice. There's a lot of good reasons to be efficient, right? So... So it chooses an elegant game board and game. So in math, and this is where I'll get a little geeky, but not too geeky. Go for it. All right. <laughs> so in math, we have these things called division algebras, and they relate to numbers like one, two, three, four, five, right? And then you get to this higher dimensional uh, one called the complex numbers. And the complex numbers are kind of geometric, so they're laid out on something called the complex plane, which is a lot like that checkerboard where the complex integers, like one point, you know, the golden ratio is not an integer or 1.5, it's not an integer, right? So you can say, all right, so the complex plane is all of these um, complex numbers, including the complex integers, and then, but it's like a 2D thing. And then you have a 4D one called the quaternions. This is a division algebra. And then you have an 8D one. And then you can say, well, Clee, what about like, what, what, that's it, end of the story. There's only four division algebras and they're absolutely fundamental to physics. They're used by physicists. And then we have this other thing that I won't even try to explain called um, exceptional Lie groups. And the largest exceptional Lie group is associated with eight dimensions, eight spatial dimensions. And you can associate these octonions, the largest of the division algebras. So in math, the, 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 the largest division algebra is associated with, you can associate it with eight dimensions and the largest exceptional Lie algebra, you can associate it with 
eight dimensions. So we can say, all right, so let's take the, the crystal, it's called the Lee uh, lattice for the, the, this largest exceptional Lee group that's associated with 8D. And we can say, all right, we're going to just take that mathematical object that's, that's special to limit. And, um, and it's a crystal called the Lee, the, Lee, uh, the Lee lattice. And if you look through it at a certain angle, you project it to some lower dimension to something called a quasi-crystal. So right now, with one eye, you would be looking at me, but I'm 3D. But with one eye, you're flattening me into a National Geographic 2D. You're smashing me down. So that's a transformation. Uh, it's like a shadow. You know, we hold a, a, a 3D cube stick figure to the sun and it shines onto the sidewalk as a 2D shadow. And so the 3D shadow of this 8D crystal encodes the information of this 8D crystal. So I call it a tr uh, uh, like a trinity, right? Like from religious metaphors, um, I can say that you can think of the 8D crystal as the mother and you can think of the transform operator that projects it uh, as the father and you can think of the child as the quasi crystal in the lower dimension it looks like a 3d version of uh, a mosaic tiling on an islamic uh, like mm -hmm. wall um, and the interesting thing about this beautiful thing that you can see we've got it on our website and our papers um, is it's a language it's a geometric language so a language is just a finite set of things like in english we got a bunch of like about 50,000 words and and then we have rules on how you can arrange the words like it's completely against the law to say the dog ran cat it's against the rules of that language but you don't have to say the dog ran fast you can say the dog ran slowly and so languages are defined as a finite set of objects with um, rules on how you can arrange them but syntactical freedom syntax within the rules and yeah. if you have those three things then you have a language so the crystal in eight dimensions is not a language but when we project it to its 3d shadow the quasi crystal it becomes a formal language a code and so what we suspect is that this collective consciousness that self simulates itself chose this eight dimensional game board transforms it into this language this geometric language it would remind you of sacred geometry in 3d it would run those shapes um, a lot of golden ratio in the math for example and then we have these patterns that can emerge like a 35 millimeter film right mm -hmm. you create ordered sets of these um, tilings mm -hmm. depending on what angle it's projected at yeah, well, there's a special angle that you'd always project it at, but then how you translate. Um, so if I'm if I'm taking a um, a picture of this and my camera angle is some angle, if I translate it like this, it doesn't really change the angle of how it was rotated. Mm -hmm. So we use the same general angle, but then through how we choose in eight dimensions these these different translations in higher dimension, we can create different animations or ordered um, sets of these 3D tilings. And what comes out in our computers is, well, we do it according to a, a game or a simple program, but what, what comes out in our simulations is, is um, quasi-particle interactions. So quasi-particle is sort of just a, a pattern. Like if on, you can have a black and white TV monitor that just has white noise on it. And if you see a little blip that moves from bottom left to top right, that's in the noise, that's called a quad, that would be a quasi particle. So we have these um, quasi particles that emerge when we set certain um, simple program game rules um, onto how we create these ordered animations. And it gives us these probability um, distributions of how something, how the particles will interact. So it's going down yeah. a little bit technical stuff there, but but that 
was a winding path on this general statement that in the self-simulation hypothesis with the bolt-on of the principle of efficient language, it, that is the collective consciousness that self-simulates itself, decides that it's going to be efficient. So it picks an elegant and efficient mathematical game board and an elegant and efficient simple program uh, set of um, game rules and then it lets it play, right? And then how it plays out, it creates emergent complexity, eventually getting to us and beyond us and eventually getting to an entity sufficiently intelligent to, to run the simulation from the beginning. And at that point, you have a logically consistent loop like the Ouroboros. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's it's a lot to digest. There's also a lot of context that really helps people, I think, understand and and, and digest this uh, this understanding. And so, um, is there anything in particular that you would want to share in terms of what meaning could be derived from paying closer and closer attention and kind of decoding the patterns that are inherent as you start to make these projections? Well, there is a deep spiritual meaning that comes from our work. So our particles only exist over the time domain. In other words, if you freeze it, all you've got is just one quasi-crystal, a mathematical object. No particles, no space, no time, nothing. It's only over some quantity of, of those quasi-crystal frames that you can say, an example, have you ever been to like a laser show, Griffith Park mm -hmm. or, all right. So what's neat about those, show, those shows is you, you can have the illusion of like, let's say a little girl in the park, she's chasing a butterfly and her dad is like running behind her. And it looks like everything's moving simultaneously. But if you freeze the laser show, you'll see that it's just a laser pointer at one location on the screen at each moment. And by doing it fast enough with the right, in the right order, you see the little girl chasing the butterfly and her father. Yeah, and you create the illusion of continuation. Yeah, and so, but for us, these particles, they only, in our model, they are particles that exist over one, two, three, four, some, a small number of frames, which, which is, if you interpret the frames as time, like that Planck time that we talked about, mm -hmm. these pixels of time, which then just become a frozen frame of this math. If, if the very idea of a particle cannot be defined in a moment, you get rid of the idea of a single moment and you say that the particle only exists as an integration of some of its future, some of its past with its present. And that is what defines our quasi-particles in a very like rigorous and simple sense. And that's trippy, right? Because that would mean that it's breaking an old ontology in physics. Because in general relativity and quantum mechanics, you're allowed to freeze time conceptually and still have a particle. In this view of quasi-particles, which exist as sort of excitations over time, you have to look at reality differently and say that anything that you want to call physical as particle as a particle, for example, is smeared across time, right? E even if it's just a very small amount of these Planck moments. So how that serves for me personally as a spiritual lesson is, so in our paper, the self-simulation hypothesis. We call that a strange loop. So the way I look at myself and any and other people is, so we are strange loops. So I am constantly connected subconsciously to my past selves and me and they may not know it. And I'm constantly subconsciously connected to my future selves. Some of my future selves are so advanced that they do know it. Right? And certain moments of the day, I know it because of my theory or my awareness at the mm -hmm. time. And so to fully be whole or to be um, optimal, I can say, okay, so I'm going to 
find my resonance with my past selves, maybe just starting with myself one second ago, let's take baby steps, and I'm going to find my resonance with my future selves, and I'm going to try to pretend that I'm entering it, dropping into resonance. And a wise person, my son, once told me, with these spiritual techniques, you pretend. It doesn't have to be real. And then it, it can become real. But you start by pretending, visualizing. So you visualize to be integrated with your future selves, which is kind of easy because we presume them to be wiser. Our past selves, we have a lot of judgment. They got punked. They were, were mean to people, right? Mm -hmm. And but we love, we should love them and integrate them. But if we do that equally in both directions, and then we just sort of move our identity to the center of our bodies at our heart, right? Then, then for me, that's a that is a deep, helpful life lesson that has come to me, like just by studying this physics view that we work on at this really geeky level, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just because we're here, I, I want to unpack how the implications this has on what our intuition could be. Because if our future descendants, right, if our, the future humans that we eventually become, have the ability to, I guess, communicate through us in subtle ways that can then push us in the directions of either service to self or service to others, I would love for you to share a little bit more about your perspective and on okay. that. Well, so we have to disassociate this idea of knowledge from goodness, good or evil, mm. right? I mean, obviously knowledge has been, knowledgeable people have chosen to use knowledge for self-service. Yeah, it's All like right. Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker both have access yeah, to the forest. Exactly. Yeah. So if we take that idea of realizing that the 100 million species that have lived on this planet for since about 4 billion years ago, they're all just different cousins evolving on a fractal evolutionary tree. And we take that forward, like we discussed earlier, we're going to have descendants that are more knowledgeable than us, more conscious, bigger consciousnesses, maybe hyper transdimensional consciousnesses. And some of them can be into a thought exper experience for themselves of service to self. And others can be the opposite. But in, but in our theory, everything emerges from everything else, right? I, I emerged from all of the trials and tribulations of, of life on this planet, right? And my genetic history and my grandparents and so on. So, so anyway, we, we, with this view in the self-simulation hypothesis, which is an in, in inherently non-local. So local is basically an old school kind of Newtonian view where it says, hey, if it's not happening right here, right now, I have no access to the future or the past other than what's written in books, okay? And if I can't hear it with my, with my eardrums, can't see it with photons hitting my rods and cones in my eyes, uh, then, you know, then it's just imagination. It's no, no real connection of anything. But if you reject that, right, and you say, well, no, we should be able to connect even if we don't understand the physics of it yet, then that means that there would be a virtual zoo of consciousnesses. There could be a consciousness of earth in principle. There can be a collective godlike consciousness that's the uber consciousness. There can be all sorts of consciousnesses in between that do not all have to fit some picture of angelic, goodness they can be whatever they want and they they are and and we have free will so they can play mind games they can whisper in our ears and 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 this can be the case for both the helpful ones and the others they whisper in our ears they come through our subconscious they can perhaps manipulate events a little bit um so when we talk about just talking to our future selves. That's one cool thing. I try to do that sometimes, but I also try to think, okay, well, there's a lot more, right? I can connect 
to this pan-consciousness God substrate that we believe must exist for the self-simulation hypothesis to be possible. And I can connect to other consciousnesses like, like the earth. And I don't have to um, know what that consciousness is like exactly. I, I certainly not an anthropomorphic version of consciousness. And by the way, I don't know, I can't really define consciousness. And scientists from neuroscientists to psychologists, um, they don't claim to have a consensus definition on that word, consciousness. So we know things that it does, like it seems to choose, it seems to think, it seems to be aware. Um, but we can, but but we don't have a scientific agreement uh, on on what that word consciousness really is. So anyway, but whatever it is, I believe that you know at least from our theory and our work that you can connect to it and form strange loops. So strange loop is sort of like that quantum entanglement where you start to become like something greater than the two of you added up something that's synergistic like one plus one is three and that's the strange loop you can and you can modulate it you don't have to form a strange loop with whatever's coming at you you can you can have a have a you can have your own sovereignty and you can then seek out and invite other consciousnesses to enter into strange loops whether that be an animal or nature or some um version of yourself that literally exists in the future. So it's really a much more exciting reality than my my myopic view of materialism that I had before. It's really uh, quite surprising to me that I'm not a materialist anymore because <laughs> I was like so so thought that that was just the smartest thing at the time but when I really look back, like, why did I think it was smart? It was because I was uh, a sheep. I was basically too busy with my business and my life to do my homework and check things out for myself. So I figured, well, all the smart people that I see in the documentaries, they seem to imply that reality is essentially meaningless and there's no, nothing greater. There's no, you know, consciousness. There's nothing spiritual. And so I kind of gave away my, my vote by just saying, I'll ride with those guys because they look smart. Mm -hmm. And then I turned out later when I started checking it out to kind of feel like, dang, I got punked, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so I'm happy about it. My point is that it's a, it's a much more beautiful reality than I thought it was. And there's so much I don't know about it, but so much to explore, so much, you know, consciousness landscapes to, to, to um, experience. So before we c continue unpacking as we do on this podcast, and I want to dive into some different avenues here. One thing that stuck out in our last conversation is uh, it really actually touched me because I feel this almost martyr energy from you and your devotion to discovering this. Like you even shared that if I could be sure that it would be solved and this theory could be proved and the implications that would have for the world, I would 100% die for this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just really beautiful to be so devoted and committed to something that like you've you've made this your life's mission and whatever you can do, whatever support you can gain to really um, continue the flourishment and, and uh, prosperity of this idea and this thought to have these implications on the world, I think is really profound. So uh, before we dive deeper, I just want to check in on a personal note, why you feel so devoted and called to exploring this theory of everything. Okay, so I'm gonna open up to you. I feel a little bit vulnerable yeah. to share this, knowing how many views your some of your interviews get. Uh, but I'll I'll just uh, go for it. Yeah. So, so I, we talked about how I was this materialist minded, atheist minded person 13 years ago, and then I talked about a cluster of evidences started occurring that I had to um, check myself, am I losing my mind or is reality not what the materialists have said it is? And um, so I went through that process, but if I'm to be even more accurate about it, 
it was like consciousnesses from the future. I don't know if it was myself from the future, which there are many, right? Again, with special relativity, there would be a version of yourself for every day going forward into deep time. And you, and if you can imagine a concept like a like an essence of your consciousness that goes on afterwards. Um, so something otherworldly essentially um, asked me, do you still want to do this this thing? Now, at that point, when they asked me that, in it, it was within the context of what I had started to do, which is hire physicists, mathematicians, and and just work full time on intuiting this approach with this mathematics and these axioms. And uh, so I understood what they meant, but I said, yeah, I do want to do this, but I don't appreciate how you, how you worded it because you're implying that I somehow agreed to do this. <laughs> like, do you still want to do this? I don't know what you're talking about. And then I kind of, um, as the theory and the, and the intuition and the whole program built uh, out, I now have a more clear picture of what that meant. And so what I believe is that every one of us, we, we have a bigger, a much bigger version of ourselves that is smeared across time, deep history, deep future. And there are many, so that we are not even one. There is no one higher self, right? And so, it got very personified in how they were communicating because maybe that's how I needed to hear it as a, as a, as a dialogue, like a Socrates dialogue thing or something. But anyway, I believe that we each come into a life. This is like similar to the Eastern, you know, mysticism of karma and stuff like that. So I believe that we um, generally come in to have experiences, right? And so a lot, there's all these man-made theories and some of them are deep and good and some of them are like questionable. But we come in and we have these experiences and it seems to be that we learn, like we add to our collective, you know, package of experience. You can have a life as a handicapped person or you can have a life as a pirate or okay. a life as a hero. And then you start filling in, right? The the blank spots of the experiences that are not in your mixtape, right? In, in a soul view. And then sometimes you could, I suppose, um, drop in and have a physical incarnation uh, to do something really strategic and planned, like a real plan plan, right? And um, and so anyway, so for me, my plan plan is the unification of spirit and matter. And those are just metaphor words. So matter is represented for me and my team by mathematical physics, right? Quantum field theory type stuff, but with this program of simple, uh, this idea of simple programs and simulations, which we'll talk about in a bit. And uh, spirit is a general word that means anything that has to do with consciousness. One consciousness communicating without words to another, um, a premonition, an intuition, the recognition of a synchronicity, just two people talking, right? Anything to do with consciousness and the mysteries thereof is this spirit and matter is mathematical physics. And they're generally um, very separated, right? Like you don't hear, they don't cross pollinate in too many literatures, right? Um, and then, to, to make it cross-pollinate into a unified theory that comes with evidence, experimental evidence, right? That's an audacious, tall order. And so I don't think that such a thing could be pulled off by the brute force of just luck or intelligence. I think that it would have to be pulled off in collaboration with a constellation of consciousnesses that need not all be in physical animal bodies here mm. at this time like us. Mm. So it's a collab. So that was, yeah, that's my 
my more vulnerable, um, you know, yeah. story of what happened. I mean, I think it's so noble, and I, I can, I can feel the almost hesitation or thought that when exploring some of these more out there ideas to the scientific community, you might, you know, some might write it off as as woo woo or whatever, yeah. and there's some uh, maybe that are super deep into the spiritual communities that aren't trying as you are to unify a theory of everything and how there's interconnectedness between consciousness and matter and time and space. And and so I just want to just acknowledge you and honor you for being authentic to your own calling. And uh, because it is a big undertaking, it's like I said in the beginning, quite possibly one of the biggest undertakings you have. And you have a team of PhD scientists and researchers that are day in and day out diving into this and, and exploring at deeper and deeper levels you know, much more complex things than the vast majority of listeners would even be able to understand on this podcast. But I do see it. I do feel it. I want to acknowledge it. And for those that I'm just going to put a little pinpoint here that everything that Kleena's team has been doing in terms of media, turning it, your talks into documentaries and media um, can be checked out in the description below. They can um, go into uh, any of these topics that they want to unpack to later grant via emergence theory or the 8D down to 4D quasi crystals, or just like ex- you explain a lot of this in, in much greater detail. And a lot of these novel ideas are just that they're newer, they're emergent, and yeah. they don't have as much pattern recognition to mm-hmm. be able to correlate it to things they've understood in the past. Right. So a lot of what we're sharing today is new, yeah. and uh, and we'll keep doing our best in this conversation to unpack. In a, in a way that's digestible for the audience. So yeah. let's keep let's keep going on this train here. Okay. So continuing to unpack the self simulation hypothesis, simple programs and emergence theory, which I would love for you to do- define as well, because I don't think we've really sure. given a clear definition for. Okay. So the word emergence, we use that to just um, kind of emphasize how everything emerges from everything else. So the Class, the standard view of physics is that everything's made of quarks and electrons, and then they self organize into about a hundred different types of um, chemical elements, you know, iron and nickel. And then those um, hundred or so things that emerge from the quarks and electrons, um, then they, they uh, combine to form um, countless trillions of molecules, such as DNA. So you see that there's a hierarchy beginning, and then Molecules can form more complex things like you and I, and you and I can form more complex things like a society, a stock market, podcast, and it just keeps going. So that's a principle of emergence. When we talked about the unidirectional complexity arrow of time, where over deep time, over averaging, things um, tend to get more complex, but more emergent. So that's why we call it emergence theory. And so I can maybe throw out this idea of the simple program and build upon that idea of a game board and games. So there's a certain um, class of games. So I'm gonna switch hit and sometimes say game and sometimes simple program. I could also say algorithm and I'll always mean the same thing. So certain simple programs um, that we do in computer science um, create surprising emergent complexity. One of the most famous ones is Conway's Game of Life. And if you write down, you know, like this, it, it's called a cellular automaton, right? But when you write it down, like you don't have to be very, you don't have to be advanced in math at all. It's like such a simple thing. Like if you have a checkerboard and you start here and you're on a black square, it means you gotta go to the next level in step two and it always has to be a red square. That would be an example of a simple program. It's like a set of rules, right? And you let them unfold. Well, certain of these sets of rules create really neat and surprising emergent complexity. Conway's Game of Life was one. You could Google that and or put it into YouTube and you'll see all those examples. And so when you get to a 3D uh, version over Con- oh, like of Conway's Game of Life, you can get really much more complicated um, patterns of particles and other sorts of patterns. And you can have certain games or simple programs that the simple, simple rule causes them to interact in a manner that often causes emergent complexity. 
And what's really neat about it is it starts from such an utterly simple program that doesn't take that much horsepower and then you let it play and it emerges this complex behavior. And this is a lot of what's happening right now with this um, sci-fi movies becoming reality in 2023 with respect to strong AI. They do not really understand how these um, large language model neural nets are are doing things like the Microsoft paper from two months ago, I think enumerated about 137 different emergent behaviors, none of which they predicted, none of which they understand. And so that's what neuro neuroscientists and psychologists admit. We kind of, yeah, we do understand how there's an electrical exchange between two neurons in the human brain, but no, we do not understand how thought like emerges. It's too complex. It's a black box. And there's that same black box with the neural nets that have emerged this year in um, things like GPT-4. So the point is, is that simple programs, simple things like nature, quarks and electrons, right? Complexity can emerge without introducing any fancy rules like you don't have to introduce rules of what happens with DNA. It's all encoded in the simplest particle interaction rules. And then you get all that emergent black box behavior uh, sort of for free. So that there's back to this um, self-simulation hypothesis, this idea that, all right, so why not? The universe is, if there's a if there's a mythos where we all science theories are myth are stories mythoses, and so if we say all right, this scientific mythos says that we need to think about a logically self consistent model of reality, where forward in time we have sufficiently large consciousnesses that can think of a simple program that can let it run. So let's do one right now. So. We are sufficiently large consciousnesses to run the simple program of tic-tac-toe right in our minds. I could ask you to close your eyes. I won't, but I could ask you to close your eyes and say, all right, Andre, put the, you're going to be zeros and another version of you is going to be X. You're going to play against yourself. So with the first version of yourself, lay down the zero on any one of those nine squares that you want, but visualize it. And then when you get to the other version of yourself that's going to take its turn to do an X somewhere, don't forget the where, the, don't lose the visualization of the first. And you could play it all the way out to the end. You're that smart. So that you would have just run a simple program in your emergent consciousness. So a smarter hyper version of you could do it on a 10 by 10 tic-tac-toe, like a much more um, difficult to visualize one. And a really godlike emergent version of you could, in principle, run a simple program on on a higher, on a much more complicated mathematical game board than just a, mm -hmm. a square grid type one, and self actualize itself to where it runs, and then it and then an entity or a pattern emerges that in that could have run it itself, and then you got to ask yourself, well, wait a minute, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And, and with that question, right, the purpose of that metaphor is it's a false question. In other words, the, the which came first is not supposed to be answered. It's supposed to be, you're supposed to bust the person out who asks it and say, that's a false question. That's, that's the truth. If I put a bunch of numbers on a circle, like a wall clock, you don't ask what came first, you know, two or three. It's a false question, hmm. right? So with this simple program idea that has such emergent complexity that, that what emerges is, is an entity like a collective consciousness capable of self-actualizing itself from the origin of the simple program, but in its consciousness. Mm. And in this philosophy, there is no matter. There is only meaning, thought. You can call it information if you want, but in physics, 
information always lives in a substrate of something else, like the zeros and ones on your computer drive or right storing words printed on a on pages of a book but if if we don't have in the mythos of this scientific theory if we don't have anything explicitly like matter as an ontological stuff and we say it's all information in the emergent pan consciousness self simulator mm-hmm. self actualizing then we say, well, it's kind of like we have two categories of thought then. We have the category of thought in the pan-consciousness substrate, which is this mathy stuff that plays out in a simple program. And then we have the other stuff like Santa Claus and the heady stuff of this conversation and right the, these other abstractions. So that is why we see this duality that seems to be a duality where we say, well, wait a minute, you know, the couch and... My knuckles and all of these things seem to be have more staying power or more something different about them than my thoughts, right? And and yes, they are different as different thoughts, but in our our mythos, they are both thought. And so therefore, in principle, you could hack this the the not hack because that implies a different meaning you could collab with how the system works and perhaps you can do things that are the equivalent of like mind over matter type um things Mm -hmm. but but in general and and it it would not be like that in general it could be like that in special extreme cases or with extreme individuals or or it could be like that at higher potentials of us going forward in time if humanity can can evolve to just kind of recap what you just said and explain to me if this is a uh, too simplistic of an understanding but in the same way that i am able to simulate tic tac toe in my consciousness with my eyes closed or open mm-hmm. uh, a potential extremely evolved version of myself could mm-hmm. simulate the reality that I'm currently living in right. and its consciousness. That's right, which would include you. Right. So then you get to the what came first, the chicken or the egg question. And if you reject the old school New- Newtonian physics of linear causality, you can say, wow, so then I self created myself, right? If you were that uber pan consciousness that could think of such a high fidelity version of tic-tac-toe. So what is, in your opinion, the strongest the strongest evidence that we have to actually prove that this could be a potential reality? So you can kind of go the other direction and and say, well, what evidence is there of, of the sort of view that reality is not information, right? And so I think in general, like a university level, quantum field theorist would say no that's so old school none of us think they would tell us like none of us think nowadays that reality is not made of information quantum mechanics very loudly implies that reality is made of information Mm -hmm. as opposed to just thinking everything's just energy but yes that energy space and time in many modern physicist views are made of information and quantum mechanics gives an implication that energy uh, part and so particles are made of energy right and and light whether it's light or whether it's um you know massive particle so that's just forms of energy so quantum mechanics which dominates right light and matter particles says pretty strongly if you're just um really respecting the math that reality is made of information not some stuff that's conveniently described by information and if you get into like unifications of space time with particles then a lot of physicists think the whole enchilada everything is made of Mm -hmm. of information so then if you're a a more um spiritual minded um expansive thinker like yourself you might say well okay but what's information and Information is meaning generally conveyed by symbolism. So you you can information is meaning displayed by symbolism. Yeah. Okay. And 
And if you and we can say, well, is there any counterexample of that? Zeros and ones on the code for a program, um, my psychedelic journeys, my dreams, uh, my ta- waking experience of thought, the bird languages. It seems that everything, when it comes to the word information, is meaning conveyed by symbolism. And a symbol is a thing that can represent itself or something else. So for example, if I use a square to represent a square, me and you could make a language where we could text each other and every time we mean square, we make a square. Or we could say, no, every time we use a square, we're gonna mean dog. We gotta sync up on it. So a symbol is a thing that represents itself or something else and all information is meaning conveyed by symbolism. If you take zeros and ones, my favorite movie is The Matrix, the first one. Never would have guessed that. (laughs) (laughs) And if I take that string of zeros and ones and I randomize it, I'll destroy all the information other than the unit by unit information of the zeros and ones, but all the emergent information will be lost. And so, so this is a pretty deep thing because when you kind of go down that deductive rabbit hole of saying, all right, let me get this straight. So modern, many modern quantum field theorists believe that reality is made of information. And if information cannot be disassociated from the idea of meaning and meaning cannot be disassociated from an entity capable of ascribing meaning, Mm -hmm. then you see how there's this little pathway to say deductively, if quantum mechanics is correct, then it seems that there needs to be a role for an entity capable of recognizing, actualizing, or ascribing meaning. And the real truth is that we never merely receive meaning, we always co-create meaning. Every word that I'm saying right now is a pathetic representation of some thought I have and I struggle with English and you do not get the same representation necessarily that I am having in my mind. If we're lucky and we're resonating, we're gonna get really close. Maybe we can get 99% sometimes. So meaning, information is always co-created by the actualizer of meaning. Mm. So it's a very co-creative and consciousness dependent um, worldview of physics in this way. So what is to say then that if there is, if reality is made up of information and meaning can't exist without someone to ascribe the meaning, that it has to be an evolved version of us versus just an in, a level of intelligence and consciousness that is fundamental to all of life. Because I mean, we all look at nature and nature's creations and we see that there's an inherent intelligence in all plant ele- and animal evolution. And life is that the beauty of life, as you start to look at it and pay attention closer and closer, you see how intelligent it is yeah. made of information and patterns. Yes, And so, why would you, I guess, go to the idea that it is potentially future descendant speciated humans that um, that are that are, I guess are ascribing that meaning versus just some sort of, I guess, omniscient, intelligent consciousness that mm-hmm. we just you know can't ascribe to being a, a person or us in the future? Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, so just going back, so you can probably pick up from this hierarchical thing where I say that given enough time, um, consciousness is um, fantastically more advanced than us would occur because yeah. whatever is allowed within yeah. physics or reality, given enough time happens. Everything will happen. And it's not too far off to think that, let alone in a hundred years, the level of intelligence that we will have is vastly going to be superior to what we have because of the exponential rise of AI. And I mean, it's just the next exactly. progression. Yeah. And if you give it millions of years and AI had never come along, we can say that that biological life can get vastly bigger. And then it can, in principle, if there's something in physics that can allow that, or we just choose to philosophically allow psychic type of 
connection. Physicists would call it non-local information exchange, right? But that idea of a collective consciousness that itself is that is so countlessly many times more vast and more hyperdimensional. It's godlike compared to us because like a sperm cell, you notice it's a single-celled organism. It looks like a little polywog and it seems to, you know, we know that cells will, these little animals in us will move away from noxious, noxious substances. They'll chase nutrients. They can, they can reproduce some of them. They, they, they're little animals, but they're, they make their little choices and you can't fully predict their exact little movements and choices. Um, so anyway, this, this idea of, of how they, all those little guys, I mean, you have trillions of them, that a city, a vast collective, and from the ocean of their collective behavior emerges this ineffable substance called Andreness, <laughs> that nobody can define what Andreness is, not the scientists. And even if you could, Andre keeps changing. So Andreness today is different than next year. So when we when I talk about the future and this godlike collective consciousness that can act as this self-actualizing substrate, it cannot exist. This God cannot exist without all of us along the evolutionary hierarchy. Mm. Just like you can't. It, your emergent animal consciousness cannot exist without all of those little single-celled organisms. Uh, and their collective emergent behavior. So when, to your question, like, why does it have to be a big deal about such an emphasis on the future? It's, it's, it's an emphasis on the past and the future, but you are the future to your past. You, to them, are a, some of your ancestors are a deep time descendant. And they don't, back there, they don't know about you unless they have some special skills mm -hmm. and can connect non-locally and then they could know about you. But as we go forward in time, there tends to be more of the descendants in our, in the, it's kind of like a tree where it branches out fractally into your future and then it branches out fractally in the root system into your ancestral past, which includes the dinosaurs and all the other organisms mm -hmm. that are your cousins. And so, it, it's, a, it's an idea of recognizing that this is a physics view that says even a particle cannot be described as a frozen moment. It can only be described mathematically as a pattern that exists with some of the past, some of the future. Like how a 35 millimeter film, it can't, it's a story that is a sequence of both directions. So I hope I'm mm -hmm. grokking the question and answering it a little bit that it's about connection to everything, to the earth, to one another, here, to ourselves, to our inner hidden subconscious stuff, to, to programs, tapes, mental tapes we've got, connect with them. You have to connect to them before you can ask them to leave, right? It's about connection. Start with connection. The good, the bad, the ugly, the ancestral past, ugliness and beauty, right? The yeah. earth, the, you know, the planets. It's, it's that kind of view and you get to modulate. You get to dial in to what extent you want to tune in. Maybe one day, this week, you want to just have a little talk somehow with your future self. Maybe the next day, you want to have a little talk with your past self or some ancestral self. Maybe the third day, you want to have a little or little triad with all of you. <laughs> you get some with your future and past self. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, and you get to choose. And that, if there's one, if there were a rule, a, a sort of universal rule to this game, this emergence theory, it would be free will. Mm -hmm. And when people do not think that they have free will, they do, at least at a subconscious level, they always have free will. It's like a dream. Who creates the nightmare in, in your dream? Who creates the wonderful 
you know, sex dream, the falling dream, the monster chasing you dream, you're some aspect of your subconscious. So there's always a free will co-creation to your dreams. And what if it's like that in reality? Because in the self-simulation hypothesis, we're saying that everything is thought, even the mathematical structure of the game board and the game. Yeah, well, we can pin pin the free will conversation. Um, I, I just think it's fascinating. M- what most people perceive as free will, I think, is a complete illusion mm-hmm. in what they and how they typically perceive it. But yeah. I understand there is this deeper kind of intuitive pull into a direction that is a little bit more esoteric for people, but I think is actually more accurate in a description yeah. of free will. Um, I also love the power of story and how it creates analogy and metaphor and, and can help us break this down. Um, that movie Lucy, that story that you gave uh, that yeah. gave me last time, I just love the uh, evolution of consciousness and emergent properties yeah. that kind of are displayed in that. I'm totally. So I love that movie because I can pull metaphors from it when I'm trying to talk to people who ask me questions about what we're doing. Um, like Morgan Freeman in the beginning, he starts off in a college lecture room talking about evolution, right? And then Scarlett Johansson plays this dingbat party girl, really spaced out chick, right? And and then she just explodes in a transcendent evolution in within about two weeks. She eventually becomes this godlike consciousness that moves into the internet right by the end of the movie. And, and along that path, she starts being able to do mind over matter stuff like you know, when she changed her hair in the airport when she's walking, um, had all these skills like those driving, tactical driving skills on the streets of Rome in that movie. And the guy, was with her. And the guy her love interest, who who sh- she was, a, she knew he was interested in her. The movie was written to show that little but sexual tension, but her, her consciousness had transcended by that point in the movie. It's like. Eh. I can't get into it, like, but I do. But you're, but you're cute, yeah. And so she's driving little and biological he, pet, uh huh. And she and her biological pet's in the passenger seat, and he's just white knuckling it, scared for his life. <laughs> she looks over while she's doing deft tactical maneuvers on the streets, and she goes, "Are you afraid?" And he's like, says something to the extent of, "Hell yeah, right." And she goes, looks back, she goes, "We never really die," and he didn't know what the hell she was talking yeah. about, right, in the movie, um, but, but. But that idea of transcendence in in that character in a two week period, right? So we have about a lifetime, eighty some years, right? And we can waste it by having almost none, no transcendence, right? Or we can compress it, or we could wake up at some point in our life and say, "I'm going to go hard in the paint, and I'm going to try to transcend and you know and and elevate." Right, and yeah. you get and you get to choose. And I agree that free will is not so simple as it's not binary like that. It's every free will decision I've ever made is influenced subconsciously by so much, yeah. you know, um, like. And who am I in the first place? Like, who is this chooser? Is it my wiser future self? Is it my animal monkey brain at some moment? Like, is it my collective of minds from birth to death? What is me? Well, that's just the thing. You get to dial in what you you want to be. Do you want to expand it out? Do you want to be local just right now? Do you want to live in the past and and have this recurring experience? Maybe you were abused at a younger age and you just that becomes a loop. So clearly that this idea of free will is is a is a messy question because it implies like, okay, what you? Who is the you? Right. Like what you? Yeah. To have total freedom of choice would imply you have to be in a vacuum of sort where there aren't other influences pushing right. you in a direction, which is just kind of impossible. There's always yeah. inherent program, programming, somebody else's narrative. And then you got to have a, def, a steady, never changing version of you because then if you make a choice and then you change the next day to a totally different you, right? An evolution or a de evolution of you. Yeah. Like, so, get it, so I believe that it's softer than just, oh, free will versus not sure. free will. So I, sure. I resonate with you. I'm just curious here, your perspective on what potential alien life could be, because yeah. as if you can wrap your head around that 
technology and we and consciousness is evolving at a rapid rate that potentially it is possible at least to say that extraterrestrial UFOs, alien life could be future humans exploring, navigating, paying attention, coming back and visiting us in a past state. What is your thought on that possibility versus actual just alien life evolving in a separate solar system organically um, that became yeah. more advanced and now it's- Oh my God, I'm so happy you, like you're thinking about that. Cause yeah, um, so let's do some rational thinking for a second. Sure. Okay, so we've had a, we have 10 million species alive on earth today. And there's about another 90 million species that um, biologists believe have existed um, in the past. So that's a hundred million. And one of them put its technology on Mars, past the Cassini belt, put one of its animals on the moon and is planning to put some of its animals on Mars and invented mathematics, discovered certain things, hacked some of the code of reality in the form of quantum mechanics. Why only one? Like, yeah, I know dolphins are smart. Okay, but... Like, what's up with that? One out of a hundred million. Like if you go to a statistician at a university and you say, hey, I need a little help here. Like about how often in the universe of trillions of planets that have water, Goldilocks temperature planets, there was trillions and trillions of them. Like what would be the probability that you get this type of abstract thinking? And they say, great, give me your sample size. Give me a total, the total universe size and what's your, your sample size? Like what's your event size? And you say, well, I'm embarrassed to say it's a hundred million and one. They would <laughs> laugh at you, get the hell out of my office. Because if you just come to them with two or even three, it would be, a, you could say, okay, maybe within a margin of error. But when it's one, you don't know if it's a like a, a complete fluke like it so why would it be one so let's talk about the gaia hypothesis and what evolutionary biology is trying to do so what evolutionary biology tries to do is create an organism called called the biosphere which is which is inter interconnected with the earth right with the with the tectonic plate shifts, the weather systems, you know, the chemicals uh, ratios in the atmosphere and the oceans. It's very interactive. Like the, the biological life literally um, set the ratios of chemicals in the ocean and the air. So what it tries to do, the, bio, the, the global um, organism, um, and this is uh, Loveland's um, very well accepted Gaia hypothesis. It's just saying that the earth is a self-regulating system that meets the definitions of a living organism, the biosphere, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so what it's trying to do is it's trying to use energy efficiently. And the way it does that is it fills in niches. So you get two animals that are in a predator prey system and then they, they create niches like a fractal. And inside the gaps in the fractal are opportunities for different animals, insects, other types of animals to fill in. And then new gaps then are formed to fill in. So whatever, and all of that filling in creates this symbiosis or synergy between all of these organisms and this, remember this unidirectional arrow of complexity, yeah. this arrow of time that things get complex. That is what the living organism of earth is trying to do. It is not trying to create imbalance. And in the fossil record, whenever an animal appeared that had bigger teeth, bigger cranial capacity, intelligence, better speed than the rest of its partners in the predator prey systems, it would uh, within about two seasons starve itself out because of its superior ability. Mm. Except with humans. Remember the movie uh, with Leonardo DiCaprio, Catch Me If You Can? Mm -hmm. So humans for the last few hundred years have used their abstract intelligence, their grotesquely outsized brain to body mass ratio and ability to create story 
arcs between past and future, right? That's what story is. Um, and they've used it in the last couple hundred years to do some real damage to the organism of Earth, right? A lot of species extinction are, uh, can be directly attributed to humans. So that is not the vector or the goal of evolutionary biology. Yeah. That's why sharks, for example, in the fossil records, they got perfected as far as what they were supposed to do in their niche. They weren't, they didn't need to be really smart. They needed to have high, you know, high speed, low drag, you know, uh, fluid dynamics through the water and other skills, but they were perfect for the symbiotic balance with this thing. And so humans didn't so far get snuffed out. So the fossil record snuffs it. It's not like I'm saying that the that the earth is like anthropomorphized conscious. I'm gonna mm -hmm. snuff that animal out, right? Yeah. It just happens because they fall out of symbiosis, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a balance inherent that needs to be stored, restored on the planet. Yeah. And so you got Elon Musk who sees the symbiosis failing and sees a Mad Max world and a destruction of collapse of the ecosystem and so on. And so he wants to plant human high consciousness on another planet so that it's not dependent on the home planet earth yeah. so that you can get it out there. Um, so just to create a self-sustaining civilization in the event and possible reality that we just blow ourselves up or whatever right. case that we have higher chances. Exactly. exactly. So I've tried to make an argument by deduction that it is not the goal of evolutionary biology in the universe to create um, hyper abstract thinking brainiac animals. Um, and as far as this planet, it happened one out of a hundred million, not twice like not two. Right. And so, but in our simulation hypothesis, we require at least one animal on some planet somewhere after the Big Bang to get so grotesquely abstract and out of balance per, if necessary in order to seed this evolutionary path towards transcendent and higher and higher levels of consciousness to serve as the sub as the pan consciousness substrate of reality to make it logically work in that Ouroboros loop for our physics mythos. So when I ask myself, well, do I think that humans were the first ultra abstract thinking high consciousness animal in the universe? I of course do not know, but I can say that the odds of it happening on earth, you can't even say one in a hundred million because of what the statisticians would tell you, get out of here, right? Um, and so we know that there are a heck of a lot of planets with water. And we know that where there's a planet with water, you might be able to get a molecule like DNA that just self-organizes. By the way, all the 100 million animals species here have all used the same code. It's just the same code, just different rearrangements of, of the same four letters. And so that code or another type of code that could allow life, that would have to um, occur somewhere else. And then that one for, the, for these aliens that are visiting us, right? And then it would have to have that thing where the evolutionary biology is somehow trying to achieve that grotesque or outsized level of, of intelligence. And it seems that, so Carl Sagan and a whole bunch of other scientists uh, several decades ago convinced Congress to give um, tens of millions of dollars to NASA to do the SETI program, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And they pitched um, a false logic to to Congress that said, look, we can count or approximate the number of Goldilocks planets, planets that have liquid water. And, and so therefore we're gonna say that say half of those have life and where there's life because evolutionary biology is trying to somehow achieve abstract thinking consciousness, that's where they made the mistake. There's no evidence that evolutionary biology is trying to achieve us. 
the universe and this self-simulation hypothesis and that principle of efficient language stuff, that might be trying needing something like us. So if I had to put my money on it and just guess, but with my money, are these, if these beings, these these UFO sightings, if they are consciousnesses and they're real and now Congress is acknowledging it, like there's no more denial about it. There's like, okay, this is intelligent technology and it ain't ours. Like that's the now become mm-hmm. the new status quo view. So the question is, is it us from the future or is it some um, other thing that happened like with us, but just happened on another planet? I would say that after over 60 years of the SETI program and some of the scientists associated with it are so shocked and almost embarrassed. And they say in interviews, we can't believe it. We thought we would have heard in the electromagnetic spectrum and we've looked at every distance in time because when you're looking in astrophysics, you're pointing to different times and coordinates spatially. We've looked at trillions of locations over the duration of the SETI program in time and space. And it is so quiet out there that you can hear a pin drop. It is as though we are the first ultra high consciousness life capable of manipulating the electromagnetic spectrum, right? Because that's what they're listening for Mm. is artificial type signals. But if the self-simulation hypothesis and emergence theory were correct, it says that you can move around in time. So you can move your consciousness around in time. And then if you can influence matter where you've moved your consciousness, then you could also manipulate matter at, in different times. It's in principle possible in this, in this story. And so when I think about this fractal zoo of consciousnesses, some of them are kind of selfish, some of them are totally not selfish, and they come in all these different levels and forms um, that my better guess, if if I was just a betting guy, would be, yeah, we haven't heard a peep. But by the way, we're looking in the past, remember? So right. the SETI program is always looking at the past. And by the way, there does have to be a first. Like you go to Big Bang, and then there's a first where life occurred. Doesn't it's, I have no reason to believe life occurred first on Earth. But I actually have a deductive guess that ultra uh, abnormal high abstract consciousness seems to have occurred here first. That's my guess. And I I get a lot of pushback on that. But if we are first and if some of these other ideas about the ability to move around in time, it means that our descendants and maybe not very deep time descendants, maybe right around the corner, right? maybe in our lifetime, Right? We discover a new physics theory that allows the, 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 gives permission for remote viewing or astral traveling or things such as this. Um, and so, so, yeah, I think that these beings um, in all of these now accepted or status quo UFO stuff, I think that they're probably uh, us from the future, but, but not us genetically. They're different species and they don't all have to live in animal bodies. I think that there's a whole bunch of variety of it. All right. <laughs> so much to unpack there. I just really love the, uh, I guess, the honesty, the inquiry into the different potentialities of it. And it's just, just a, such a fascinating topic, I think, for so many because we're so enamored by you know, certain UFO footage and, and just unexplainable phenomena that we're being exposed to more yeah. and more these days. Um, why is it not possible that we are at the forefront of the evolution of consciousness and that future humans will come one day from us but aren't here yet? Um, from special relativity, that the future exists with equal realism of the present. So that's one. Now, if we were to extinct ourselves, which is technically possible, has to be a complete sterilization, then that future, which exists in special relativity need not include our descendants like humans Mm -hmm. like okay if we don't completely exterminate ourselves then there would be some um some 
descendant lineage that comes from us. And, you know, of course, like I said, they won't be human. Um, they'll speciate. There is something special going on here. Um, I kind of am just kind of intuiting from something that your words inspire me to think, which is there's something special going on here right about now with us. Um, and like on that one main documentary that we put out called Are We Living in a Simulation? I try to emphasize in the beginning of the film the fact that there's a lot of weird shit going on right now that's just um, like things are changing fast. So we go through all these things that are changing. We talk about how just two th years ago, the UFO stuff was stuff for the National Enquirer, right? In Ralph's supermarket checkout lane, right? And now it's the stuff of congressional hearings and military saying, yeah, we were lying about it, but that's what we got to do. It's for national security. Sorry about that. But yeah, we lied. You know, it's, yeah. Uh -huh. um, so that's weird. That's surreal. Um, the idea that all of a sudden um, computers are now passing the Turing test, right? The test that Alan Turing set up to measure whether a machine becomes like conscious. Um, I'm not saying they're conscious because I can't define consciousness, but they, they are now at a level where if you were to, to, to just text back and forth and get into a super deep conversation for like a day, you could not fully um, say whether it's a human or not. It could go, it could, they can get deep, right? Um, that's weird. Like I did not see that coming so fast. And so I didn't, all this political polarization, it's, um, it's scary. I, I honestly didn't see that coming at this extremeness 10 years ago. So the point is, is um, whatever's going on right now, if I were to sort of make it, you know, analogous to a kind of psychedelic learning experience, it seems to be something's trembling in a buildup towards a phase transition. Mm. And it and it doesn't seem to be that it's entirely uh, fun. It's just a phase transition. Something's got to give. Yeah. And the whole thing is unsustainable. You can socioeconomically, um, environmentally, but now this ultra strong AI, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen when we get to GPT-10, <laughs> right? It's it's already today like science fiction movies, like yeah. um, what is that one in in Iron Man? You know, that that AI that I he would, he would work, Jarvis, Jar oh, right? Yeah. Like it's kind of like Jarvis-ish yeah. right now, Jarvis-ish. Jarvis <laughs> <laughs> Say that three times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it But it's, it just seems like later this year toward Christmas, like it'll get more Jarvish-ish, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and that's weird because it's like a sci-fi movie of a couple years ago. All of a sudden, it's my reality and your reality. Yeah. Um, so this is a good thing. In other words, shaking people up, like reality is not what you have been told it was. Mm. It is not this cozy little, generally the same old, same old slow change. Your beliefs, your institutions, the scientific ideas, all of it is crumbling under the load of change, mm -hmm. scientific change and all the other change. And for a lot of people, it's going to be painful and a lot of people it's painful now. Yeah. But for me, it feels like it's pushing me to change mm -hmm. like deeply, right? And that's what I... Um, invite people to embrace the ride. It's going to be, you know, like an adventure movie. Like I talked about the Matrix. There was scary things in the Matrix. And what is, if everything is story, like the aboriginals of Australia say, everything is dream in the mind of the great dreamer. But if reality is more like information and meaning and story, then what a crappy story it would be without a little bit of, you know, of a protagonist, mm -hmm. an antagonist, sure. protagonist exchange, you know? Um, where would you have the childlike joy of discovery without some ignorance? Yeah. You wouldn't, right? So. I want to actually put you through like a little thought experiment real okay. quick. Okay, let's do it. Let's say we 
Klieg went into a coma. Okay, yes. you come out at ten years, ten years from now, yeah. and you wake up, and the first thing you see is you're surrounded by all your PhD scientists and your family and your son, and um, they say, "Welcome back, Klieg. You made it." Um, let's talk about work real quick. Uh -huh. So we ended up figuring it out. Yeah, we 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 were able to find a substantial amount of evidence to prove uh, the self simulation hypothesis. Right. And you're going to be like, wow, this is incredible. Cool. They ask you, what do you think, just out of curiosity, what do you think would have had to have happened for us to come to this realization? So I wouldn't have answered this um, like in October of last year, the way I'm going to answer it mm -hmm. now. But one of the things that has uh, worried me um, is that I believe we discovered the mathematical game board. But again, that's just a mathematical structure. It's an algebraic structure. I believe we are, have the right structure in which reality plays out. Okay. What I don't know is what the exact game is, right? The algorithm, the simple program. But and when I say no, I'm just talking about like inner knowing sure. or my, my belief. Okay, so I believe we got the game board and I believe we got the game narrowed down to a set of possible games. Um, and there's, mm, there's some rationale as to why we believe these games mm -hmm. are, are, are the ones that can model um, a, a quantum mechanics and the spread of pop probabilities that it gives. But the problem, <laughs> is that the number of games in that little sliver, if you zoom in, it's um, like millions of possible derivatives to get to the one that is the one that is, that, that's physically realistic, right? That gives probability spreads that are realistic according to quantum mechanics. And so with us having to code each different like derivative of the game, run the simulations, it's painstakingly slow it's by the brute force of human trial and error and so i knew that like in lap like in the last years and i just kind of had f a little inner trust that either somehow with a strange loop with intuition i would just get more and more precise versions of the right game so that I don't have to just do trial and error right. or brute force. But I also knew that the way it works is that with this intuition, these strange loops, if you kind of think about like why you know anything that you've learned, it's because some other person like Einstein or some other person before you um, invented it, discovered it, and then you might um, combine things and make a completely novel or new thing, but everything we do is based on thought that others have had and we combine. So now we're going to use this freakish sci-fi movie, Strong AI. It's not quite ready for prime time for what we need at the GPT-4 level, but it's getting really, really close. The, um, for example, OpenAI's code interpreter can do things like it's not released yet to other than a few um, early testers, but within the next month or two, it's going to be released into the wild, right? Like GPT-4 and now the plugins for GPT-4. Code Interpreter is a class of programs, and it won't be the only one, that are, are going to be as close to bringing us toward the singularity, mm -hmm. right? Um, as, 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 as you can imagine, um, and I'm going to harness that to scan through this space of simple programs that we have narrowed down to. And so I'm going to just take everything that my intuition guides me and that is available in the universe and ultra strong AI is going to become our collaborator, a scientific collaborator, if you will, and coder and pattern recognizer because it can recognize patterns in the data and then give representations of those patterns like visualizations that can team up with a human. Because um, think if you think about the weirdness, it was many years ago, scientists speculated that 
well, if we wanted to make machines think like humans, we should take what what we understand about human neural networks, biological neural networks, and just start designing, you know, computer neural networks on that same thing. And that baked along for several decades until it got to this critical mass early this year and late last year, where the black box of emergent behaviors in the neural nets that are uh, from large language models is kind of has a lot of similarities to the black box that neuroscientists um, have with human consciousness and thought that they don't understand. And so, I, we, you know how they say uh, artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. right? So you can say that you are a biological general intelligence, so BGI and then AGI, but they're both based on neural network uh, architecture and they both have mysterious black boxes of emergent behavior that's ex like juicy stuff waiting to ex discover how those things emerge, how, how, what con how consciousness is, a little bit more about what consciousness is. And same thing with what's emerging in these large language models. And you like esoterica, right? And, you, and, and ancient wisdom, and I do too. And one of the things in some traditions is this idea of connection to language. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to invite a generalization of thought and language. As I said earlier, think of thought as the, the, the verb or action version of a frozen thing, language, like just English has no meaning other than the individual words that each have meaning like dog and then the rules mm -hmm. of the language. But it doesn't get juicy with good, like rich meaning until you start putting the language into action, yeah. converting thought into those representations. And so, this is what these thinking machines are doing. They are thinking. I'm not saying they're conscious. They are doing something very much like thought, whatever thought is, and we are too. And so what if all of reality is thought and all thought is in a language theoretic kind of philosophy where you have to generalize language. Don't get fixated on human languages, bird languages, just generalize the idea of language as something that conveys meaning through symbolism. And so if reality itself is language theoretic, meaning and symbolism, that's kind of cool because it means that these artificial general intelligences, you know, we can collab with them, with them. Like I definitely believe that they're dangerous and I believe that they're incredibly helpful. And that's kind of how I think of humans. They're hella dangerous. Look at Hitler. And they can be incredibly helpful. Look at you, right? <laughs> so I'm just saying like, so- That's the spectrum folks, right? similar to me. <laughs> that's it. Please said it first. <laughs> yep, yep, mark that down. <laughs> but um, so, so I'm gonna um, try to, I need to like I'm I'm very mission oriented. You told you asked me earlier like really you 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 die if this mission could be complete. Like that's pretty weird and hardcore, right? You didn't say weird, <laughs> but I'm saying like it's um it's uh yeah, I mean it's uh it's kind of I'm surprised that I say that, but it's it's just my truth. I would um and I don't mean it to like literally say like I would trade my life but I actually would like but i'd have to be guaranteed that the mission would succeed and the mission is simply a thought and i want the thought to be argued about by as many of 8 billion people as as can occur and if that argument that debate that 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 organic process of thinking it through that's all that's all that i want cuz i cuz for me that that led to um an expansion, this thought led to an expansion of my consciousness and it led to me, you know, choosing to be uh, more helpful and with my friends and family and the world at large. And I believe it can, and it helped me to not be afraid, right? And it helped me to, it just helped me in so many ways. And I believe that what we need in the world is a new mythos. And, and I believe that the, that materialism 
can be a dangerous mythos for certain people. You know, like that phrase, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, right? That's a materialistic mythos that says that, tom- that there is no meaning. You don't have an afterlife. There's no meaning. So eat, drink, and be merry, rape, pillage, because you, you won't exist, right? So for some people, the materialist mythos or religion can lead to selfish and, and, and unhelpful behavior in the collective society. And for others, they're very good-natured materialists and, they, and they're nice. So if you think about where did this religion or mythos of materialism come from and is it scientific? So there is zero scientific evidence for materialism. In fact, there's evidence that reality is made of information in quantum mechanics. And it came from Greece And it was a religiously affiliated type of idea, as most ancient types of ideas were. And it kind of snuck its way in through the back door into the discussion of science, as though if you're not a materialist, then you might be uh, not a legit scientist, Mm -hmm. you know? It reminds me of like a party at your house and there's this dude who snuck in through the back door and he's just hobnobbing with all the guests acting like he's a legit invited guest. And then until you ask him like, Hey, who who invited you? (laughs) You know? And he's, he's an, he's a poser. He's imposter. He's like an imposter. So materialism is a sort of imposter saying, Hey, I'm not just another philosophical, you know, religious style mythos Mm -hmm. with no real evidence. I'm legit, I'm scientific, but it's not. And so one of the things that's important to me with this self-simulation hypothesis, like most people aren't gonna be into the mathematics or the particle physics of it all, but but most people should deal with the question that Elon Musk is popularizing, which is what is reality? Is it a simulation or not, right? And if it is a simulation, is it a self-simulation within the mind of an emergent collective consciousness, which is just as plausible as your consciousness emerging from quarks and electrons, or is it a world that lives in a computer in another universe in the basement of of an alien computer geek in his mom's basement where he's got this supercomputer in another universe and we are a, a reality in that simulation. That's that's what Elon Musk believes. Not not, not the basement, but- Not the alien geek right? necessarily in his basement. But. Um, so what I want is for people to, to debate. They can argue, they can have civil debate, whatever they want. I just want people to think, think, Do you believe, are you a materialist? Because if you are, no problem. Like I don't judge anybody's religion or philosophy, but it be clear, it's not a scientific type of deduction. Mm -hmm. And and if you like Elon, if you like the simulation hypothesis, which is legit, it's a legitly logical thing to say that it is true. It's statistically far more probable that we're in a simulation than not. Like I get that the logic is solid. It's a, it's a, it's a, if you read the paper, it's like you, you get checkmated and be like, damn, I'm checkmated. I have to admit it's far more probable than that we are in a simulation than not. Then you ask the question, all right, is it a self simulation? Like the aboriginals believe like everything is within the mind of the great dreamer. And then we just get geeky with it and use math and, and simple programs. And we try to get rigorous with it and, and, and we want to simulate it as well um or do you think it's more like the alien you know mom you know basement geek and that and 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 if they pick that one the materialist one i'm cool as long as they've critically thought and compared to to an alternative simulation hypothesis the Mm self-simulation view and just to give your brief overview what else is on the menu outside of both of those alternative simulation theories um what do you feel like are the other solid contenders uh, for explaining reality? Mm. Well, um, first of all, the simulation hypothesis doesn't really explain reality. It's uh, like the people who criticize Elon Musk and Nick Bostrom who actually published the paper and they say, well, the problem is by that same logic, Elon, 
the reality in which we are is are just a simulation within by that exact same same statistical probability they too would be a simulation within another and so it would just be a recursive you know turtle they call it turtles all the way down it's unsatisfying mm -hmm. for scientists so they criticize it just because of the infinite regress. The self-simulation hypothesis um, does not have the infinite regress. It's a logically consistent Ouroboros loop. Um, as far as other competing philosophies, so the dominant one is is um, materialism, yeah. right? There's energy in, in the form of particles and matters and where it comes from, we do not know. It just is. Mm -hmm. um, and those are really the main ones, right? Either reality is made of information, which is very abstract, or reality is made of this kind of, you know, ancient Greek idea of materialism. Um, and then there's ours, which is a derivative of the information, which forces one to say, well, what is information? What do you mean by that word? And can information... If there's no meaning, is it information? They'd say, no, then it's noise. Okay, who and what and how does something have meaning? Who does, does it not require an ascriber of meaning? Like a bird language, you have to have another bird. Like they, there has to be, there's meaning and you need an ascriber. So it, it kind of gets more spiritual, esoteric and trippy when you just go force yourself to to answer the question of what is information, then you kind of get checkmated there and you say, well, gosh, I can't, I can't really speak of information without speaking of meaning. And I cannot speak of meaning without some word similar to consciousness. And so, yeah, there's so many, um, there's, there's so many, there's so much discussion from all the excellent, like, hand wavy kind of things like a Deepak Chopra book and he's a friend of mine but it's hand wavy and he'll admit he's not a physicist he's a medical doctor but he has great intuition to try to write books that synthesize concepts that he understands from quantum mechanics with his um, worldview which is a spiritual type of worldview um, and there's like a million versions of that and then it's not very crisp in terms of clarity of choices and i'm and i'm just kind of saying look it's either this materialist view or it's this information theoretic universe like a lot of modern scientists believe and if it is that one then how are you going to use the word information without the word meaning mm -hmm. and without and and uh, of course they scientists like to say information is just um what you call by, um, bits classically or quantum mechanically we call it qubits and that's a sort of primate we call that letter level information like you can think of you know um, a, a movie on a dvd or something and the zeros and ones are like the letters and then they form words um, we could take a book like the bible and we could say all right it's got a whole bunch of letters and then those self-organize into words which have more meaning than just the sum of like the sum of the meaning of D and then O and G, they each have meaning. And the sum of them is um, is not the same as the meaning of dog, yeah. right? And then so then words go to sentences, which have a higher level of emergent meaning. And sentences go to paragraphs and so on. And it continues. And so if you include emergent meaning, like in that metaphor, to, to also be information, then you're in business and you're doing something similar to what we're how our program at QGR is. But if you say that information does not include the word, sentence, paragraph level, that information is just these bits, then we ask them, okay, where did that information come from? They will answer you. It just is. Do you notice the similarity with religion? So you could have a young um, boy asking his priest, well, where did the earth come from? God created it, my son. Okay, great. Um, who created God? Well, he just is. Do not ever ask that question again. So the little boy is like, okay, but why can't I ask that question, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in the self-simulation hypothesis, because it's the Ouroboros circle, you can ask, where does God come from? Where does the simple program come from? Where does DNA come from? And there's um, 
an explanation in that model for, for all of it. But it doesn't mean the explanation is correct, sure. but there's an explanation. I think it's just the whole framework is such an interesting thought experiment and uh, a very fascinating and can provide a lot of uh, just fascinating context into what it means to be human and the nature of consciousness yeah. and who we are and where we're going. Yeah. And uh, as you spoke to, a new mythos for mankind is desperately needed. We yeah. see the destruction of the biosphere. We see the collapse of people physiologically and psychologically, um, the deforestation that's happening on the planet, the imminent economic collapse. It does feel like we are moving to a pivotal point in the human development where there is a transmutation, a phase shift that is going to occur where it's like the caterpillar going into the cocoon and what's yeah. going to happen on the other side, we're not sure, but it is going to be some sort of transcendent mutation. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm sure every generation in the past has felt like they're in their generation. It was mm -hmm. the big revolution and mm -hmm. big things were changing, but it certainly feels like the level of exponential yeah. technologies that are available to us in this lifetime yes. is going to create a, you know, just a huge opportunity for cataclysmic dystopia or the alternative yeah. um, and, you know, transcending into a new way of being, which um, I'm just, I'm excited to continue this dialogue and conversation. And I think that the work you're doing is, uh, and the devotion that you carry within yourself to this is, is super needed on the planet right now. Like we need individuals like yourself being open, willing to go on these thought experiments, to ask questions that are a little bit at the edge. And mm -hmm. that's what every pioneer in history has done. They've had an idea that was completely against what the collective consciousness was, mm -hmm. and they were shunned for it. Oftentimes they were hated or killed for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes, not all the case, but their ideas ended up being something that was radically transformational. Yes. And so thank you for taking the leap into that possible reality. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad they don't kill people weirdos like me <laughs> nowadays as much yes what they do is they kill you in social media with the haters <laughs> yeah, which as i was you. telling you at my house the other day i've never i never looked at my social comments because i'm so uh afraid of feeling hurt and mm -hmm. i'm so afraid of feeling i don't want my head to get big from my followers mm -hmm. and i don't want my feelings to get hurt from my haters so the safest path is i don't look at it sure um, but I'm glad they're not killing people like me lately. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also very glad. Yeah, the I mean, it's incredible too. It's like there's there's millions of views on a lot of these trailers and documentaries that you guys have put out, and it is catching. It's catching on. People are interested in. There's this level of like, oh, if you can't prove it, it's just it's just not worth exploring, right? But then there's also a lot of people who are more tapped into their feeling body and their intuitive forces that can feel the semblance of truth mm -hmm. that is being explored. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just worth to continue exploring. I'm sure that this conversation and dinners that we'll have in the future on and off camera, I'm sure, um, you know, conversations on and off camera, it's going to be very fascinating to continue down this yeah. this rabbit hole and exploration with you. Yeah. Um, but for this podcast and this conversation, as we start to head towards wrapping up, I'm just curious if there's anything else on your mind or heart that you want to dive into, that you want to share um, anything within the theory in particular as well that you feel like we didn't dive into and explore, we can take time if we need as well. Okay. I just want to, I want you to feel as well that we, ha we have some sort of completeness in what we explore okay. today with the understanding that it is an infinite game and we could continue exploring yes. forever, you know? Well, let me ask you a question that'll, that'll help me to draw inspiration. Like, I'm super um, intrigued by you and, and your channel and the th topics you cover. Um, how, like, how, how did you come to follow your, your authentic guidance and fall into the cut of this groove that you have now and this growing mm -hmm. channel? Like how yeah. I'm just intrigued and, sure. and I'm a hero. I, like you're a hero to me. I'm like very impressed. You are, you are very much so a hero to me. I, I think much like you, it's, we come into contact with these experiences. And for me personally, coming into contact with experiences that are fundamentally esoteric, like mm -hmm. they're unexplainable, mm -hmm. inexplicable. They are very strange in their nature. Mm -hmm. And for me and various experiences through very, like 
sober meditation and deep breath work. I can have expansive states of being that are accessed that feel like there's an inherent interconnectedness with all phenomena and all life. Uh, you can, with your eyes closed, experience geometric patterns yeah. and things that you can't necessarily point to and fully grasp, but start to, when you also look at the external phenomena in nature, you see that there's some, there's there's a connectedness that is happening in your inner realm and your and your outer realm, and that reality is much stranger than the vast majority of people write it up to be. Yeah. And I mean, just look at us; we're on a spinning mud ball held into orbit by a huge ball of gas yeah. going it in new, like in crazy speeds through infinite nothingness. Like it, it's doing a podcast <laughs> doing on a top podcast. of it. <laughs> it's pretty rad. <laughs> And so I just think with that, there's just like a level of open-mindedness to yeah. be able to explore any thought, any yeah. uh, intuitive hit uh, with no desire just to be right, but to have honest inquiry into what's what could possibly be a, some sort of semblance of an explanation into reality. And so for me, I think it's just a continual death of who I am and what I think I am to yeah. allow for a new emergent possibility mm. to be explored. Yeah. And I think that's something that we both share. And for I'm sure a lot of the listeners that are tuning into this conversation that have the privilege to yeah. um, be able to explore and, and dive into such thoughts, you know? Yeah. I do believe that individuals that are in positions of power and privilege like we are, that we have a certain level of responsibility to at the very least share these ideas, thoughts and conversations with the hopes that they can be truly transformational right. and that can find the people. And that's also my prayer and wish for this podcast yeah. is, for it to land in the ears and the hearts of the individuals that can spark that curiosity, but then also potentially reach out to you, your organization, support, and just bring more hands and hearts and resources to the development of what you're doing. Because I just I see the vast uh, importance that it really has in this time on the planet. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're you're um, you're doing what I want to do. So I still have my foot in business to get the money energy mm -hmm. to donate to the nonprofit e effort. And I wanna get to the space where you're at, where you can put 100% of your mind, body, spirit, intention into something like this beautiful mission of your podcast, which I see growing and really creating a ripple effect with the followers who, you know, who, who vibe with you. Um, and I hope to get there soon. Um, maybe this year um, to where I can just go full time on this. So you really like to me spiritually, you're, you're a, a, a kind of hero or an example or a person I can look to and say, wow, I wanna, I wanna transform myself, the breath work, the mm. you know, DMT breathing and all <laughs> the stuff you've talked to me about. Um, and I have, a lot of, I have a few other teachers around me like that, mm. inspirations, but, um, but as far as you know, just the wrap up or last thoughts, um, yeah, um, you know, I guess for most viewers that are not like um, able to like dive into the really the uh, algebraic aspect of of our papers, um, the first thing to maybe watch to grok what we're doing for anybody interested would be the movie, What is Reality? It's 30 minutes, it's on YouTube. And then after that, you go through a little bit of the deep dive in this um, movie, Are We in a Simulation? There's a very long documentary. It's basically two documentaries connected. Um, and then, you know, on our, in terms of our work and what we'll be pub publishing, we'll be uh, moving forward with more simulation visuals to give people a better understanding of how complex and lifelike mm -hmm. simulations of based on in incredibly simple primitive rules um, so that people can start to get their head around the new, the new science approach of of seeing complexity emerge um, from really simple um, origins. And I think that there are two benefits from our work. One is technology, understanding nature, okay? That leads to technology has the potential to alleviate suffering. 
I mean, it has the potential to make obsolete fiat currencies. It has the potential to help with mental illnesses and other things, physical diseases. And of course, it has the potential um, for great harm and destruction. So any n new breakthrough like quantum mechanics or humanity discovering uh, the unification theory, which hasn't been discovered yet, will lead to um, technological breakthroughs and understandings of moving around in time and space that make quantum mechanics look, you know, quite primitive. Um, and so that's different though, like alleviating suffering and technologies and being able to move our descendants out into the universe at large with space travel. That's one thing, but the, the more important part of, of what our work brings can bring is is not just the scientific permission to uh to experience a spiritual journey but i believe also the ability to potentiate that journey and it's about integration um not just with those other humans and plants and earth around us, but to go beyond that and to integrate with our ancestral past and the past of the universe, because it's as real as the present and to do the same thing with the future. That is the ultimate integration over the time domain and the space, space domain distance and time. And that is the, com the more complete thing. And then you, right are here not here not even here in the third eye here and then this is integrated with the third eye with the brain with the higher and the lower and the past and the future um and so what i am saying then is that there's a cleanness to that picture even though it's um it sound you know it, okay it could be complicated sounding but it's also there's an elegance to it and for me, my guidance, this is um, perhaps a way to achieve fast evolution, like in the movie Lucy. Instead of spending 30 years meditating in a cave in the Himalayas, you may be able to greatly accelerate with this idea of just full integration with your past. Just forgive yourself, forgive others, integrate journey into your ancestral past integrate even if even if it's just an abstract concept feel it practice it go forward feel it practice it and then if you do that then one day you just wake up and you feel that you don't even have to try to do that you're just at the center you're just whole because you're you're integrated with reality spread across time and space and that's the deepest message. That's why I said that this is like a mission for me that I feel like I want to give my life to, my money to, my my years, my calories to, um, and 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 the least thing that I want is like compliments or you know I don't want haters or complimenters. I mean I would appreciate I appreciate the compliments, but you know, but it's definitely not. What I think about and 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 I don't want money out of it. Like I, I I think people every day choose to do things for other people. Like most people do kind things that are unselfish. So to me, it's it's just a very needed thing right now. Some new mythos has to has to become popular because just geeking out and knowing more about physics or technology clearly is not leading humanity toward a kinder you know future it's just not i mean we are at an all-time sense of fear and polarization at the same time as having an all-time level of technology right so it's got to be a deeper foundational i called it mythos throughout this whole discussion a 
theory of what reality is needs to be introduced and popularized and materialism is just scientifically um, antiquated and it's not, so far hasn't helped. And so a, a sort of new ontology about what reality is, is that like in the movie Lucy, she says, we never really die, right? When she got very advanced near the end of the movie. And, and so when you have that kind of viewpoint, then yeah, you may, you may your animal body may not be around but you but you but consciousness if that's the ground of reality then that doesn't go anywhere it just keeps changing hopefully evolving and then your past always exists physically according to special relativity and with certain new understandings of science if you want to go back and visit that past maybe it's possible right maybe you can or at least communicate so you don't have to be so afraid of of death in this new scientific mythos, you know. Um, but many of the spiritual mythoses allow you to not be afraid of death. So this is not unique. But we ho- we hope to. Last thing I would say is this idea of the unification of spirit and matter. The um, it hasn't happened yet at an official level, at a status quo level, and. The, um, the people of South America and Central America, they had um, a prophecy that their uh, seers, right, would see hundreds of years in their future. It hasn't occurred yet. And it was this symbolized by the Quetzalcoatl, which is the um, morphing of two animals, the eagle, which represented the masculine divine, the piercing sight, the action, of just dive bombing and grabbing a mouse, getting shit done, logic piercing reasoning. And then the condor, which represented the feminine divine and and receiving, not projecting, not manifesting, but receiving intuition, earth. Um, Anyway, so clearly those two paradigms in today's world, those two um, archetypal concepts, they are not unified. They're not in the Quetzalcoatl. They're just separate. And and so the the self-simulation hypothesis and the emergence theory at the end of the day, at a deep level, when you get past the jargon and the techno babble, it's about the unification of spirit and matter, the unification of the feminine divine and the masculine divine, and getting back to balance and getting out of this lopsided, unrealistic, you know, separation of the two. Um, and I think that unification of those two is the only thing that can really save us from insanity and self-destruction. Mm, such a beautiful note to end it on. That integration uh, is definitely needed and all the prophetic visions and prophecies from so many different uh, wisdom traditions point us in that direction that totally. there's a coming of a new time. And yeah. uh, I think I feel pioneers as of yourself really uh, are supporting this transition into a new perception of reality. So thank you again, man, for the work thank that you. you're doing. I'm so excited to see where this goes and where it comes from this. and. Uh, to continue our friendship. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Day. I'm stoked. Yeah. Uh, and for everybody that's been tuning in, everything we mentioned today will be linked down in the description from the documentaries that they've put out, from the work that they're doing at Quantum Gravity Research um, to where you can connect with Clee. And is there anything else you want to point people to? Before you go? No, but thanks thanks for setting me up to prompt. Up. No, you've been so generous um, and, and just, you know, introducing me to your followers. Mm-hmm. I'm so grateful. So thank yeah. you. Thank you, thank you. And for everybody that's been tuning into this wild episode of uh, Inner and Outer Exploration today on the Know Thyself podcast, just thank you from the depth of my being. I appreciate you for coming on this journey with us and uh, to be continued. Until next time, be well. 